Hey everybody, it's Mr. Drake. This video covers World War II on the home front, looking at how World War II impacted uh, the United States uh, within its own borders. This is going to be the first part of a two-part series uh, on the home front. This video will go over um, the people who fought in the war and what the war's impact was on the economy and also look a little bit at the role that women played uh, in uh, the war effort. Part two of this video will go into impacts on various groups within the United States, African Americans, Japanese Americans, Mexican Americans, Native Americans, uh, and also talk about um, the final analysis of how the war impacted the country. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. First, looking at the people who fought in the war during World War II, about 16 million American men enlisted in the military for at least part of the Second World War. This is a staggering number, when you, especially when you consider that the population of the United States in the 1940 census total was 132 million. So if you do some math there, you figure half of that 132 million is women, so that's down to 66 million men. Uh, and then you figure some of those are either under 18 or over 45, um, which are you know, uh, age groups you don't normally have serving in the military. Um, so you may have been looking about half of all men that were of age to serve that served during World War II. Um, some were drafted, but a lot of people voluntarily enlisted. Um, of those 16 million uh, World War II veterans, there are just under a quarter million still alive now, according to the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, who keeps up with such things. Uh, in North Carolina, they estimate there are about 6,600 uh, veterans alive, and about 300 veterans of World War II across the country die every day. That's a rough estimate. Um, that number is going to, uh, you know, continue to increase as uh, as the World War II generation continues to age. If you think about it, um, if you were 18 years old and enlisted at the very end of the war in 1945, that means you were born in 1927, which means when this video is recorded, you're turning 95 this year. So virtually every veteran of World War II is at least 95 years old. Um, the death toll um, for American soldiers in World War II was about 419,000. Um, 405,000 of those are in combat. Uh, the remainder from disease, serving, uh, or being held in prisoner of war camps and dying of uh, various maladies or, or being executed or whatever. Um, and about 675,000 people wounded uh, or maimed. So, um, you know, there were a lot of people um, in America who, who lost somebody uh, as a result uh, of World War II or knew someone who did. The effect of World War II on the economy cannot be understated, um, or cannot be overstated, rather. World War II ended the Depression. Um, you know, we talk about the New Deal as uh, being you know, the um, uh, stimulus to the economy in the 1930s. But in 1940, unemployment was still very, very high, 14.5% uh, as America was preparing to enter World War II. So that's still a staggeringly high unemployment number. By 1944, unemployment has dropped to 1%. 1% unemployment is considered full employment for all intents and purposes. Virtually everyone who wanted a job was able to get one because there were so many jobs created in order to facilitate the war effort. Um, there was a government organization called the War Production Board. Uh, if you remember, if you're one of my students during World War I, we talked about the War Industries Board. Pretty much the same thing. Um, the War Production Board took it a step further though and converted virtually all manufacturing in the country to um, aid the US military for the war effort. Um, as just one prime example, there were no passenger cars manufactured in the United States between 1942 and 1945 because all of those factories were being used to build planes and tanks and the like. So the War Production Board was in charge of making sure that all that was needed was being produced uh, and essentially, you know, uh, coordinated uh, with with manufacturers to make sure um, that the military had all that it needed. Another method for making sure that um, the military had what it needed was rationing. Um, 
Some goods were rationed more than others, but a lot of things were needed for uh, the military or the soldiers to use. Um, gasoline, obviously a big one that got rationed because it was needed to operate tanks and planes and um, you know boats and stuff like that, the oil, right, uh, overseas. So most people were limited to three to four gallons a week, which did not go very far back then. Cars were not incredibly fuel efficient. They were very heavy and kind of, you know, these lunky things, right? Um, so... You know, there was a lot of propaganda put out by the government discouraging people from taking, like, unnecessary trips, right? Like, drive to work, drive to the store. It's pretty much it. Uh, you don't need to be driving across the country on a vacation right now because, you know, the gasoline is needed elsewhere. Um, food, like sugar and meat, were rationed. Dairy products, butter was rationed. That's why uh, margarine became super popular during World War II because butter was hard to come by. Um, rubber, which was needed for like tank treads, was rationed as well. And a, a bunch of other stuff as well. Those are just some prime examples. A lot of metals were hard to come by, so people were encouraged to take scrap metal and donate it, which is that little picture there in the bottom right. Um, you know, there were areas that were set up where you could uh, go drop off metal. You just had like laying around the property or whatever you didn't need anymore. A black market does emerge because of the rationing, people selling their ration stamps for a profit or whatever, but it wasn't really big, uh, not as big as you would think, I guess. Um, for one thing, uh, it was considered unpatriotic to do so, so people kind of you know, were seen as uh, unsavory characters if they actually tried to subvert the war effort by you know, doing this with their ration stamps and all of that. Also, the government punished it pretty severely with fines and or prison time. So um, there was a bit of a, 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 you know, negative reinforcement there when it came to um, to subverting uh, the government's efforts in that stuff. Some examples of posters that they uh, that came up uh, or put up around the country to encourage people to, to ration or, or conserve, uh, similar to the propaganda the uh, um, Committee on Public Information disseminated during the First World War, right, encouraged people to buy their, or to uh, grow their own crops, can their vegetables to preserve them. Um, there were lots of others encouraging people to like, you know, carpool, to save gas, right, that kind of thing. So we talked about the 16 million men that served in World War II. Uh, a little over 200,000 women also served in the military during World War II, um, all in non-combat roles. Uh, each branch of the military had their own uh, women's unit. Uh, the armies was called WAC, or Women's Army Corps. Um, the navies was Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. So they, you know, being the Navy, could use the acronym WAVES. It's pretty cute, right? Um, but those women worked in clerical positions as, as secretaries or aides to, um, you know, generals or officers in the army. They would uh, typists, um, typing up the, the telegrams or the letters to, to people telling them that their family members had been wounded or killed. Um, War type, you know, correspondence between officers and stuff like that. They were responsible for those things. Um, women served as nurses, of course, in large numbers, um, both in the military and for non-military organizations such as the uh, Red Cross. Um, and then women work in large numbers in factories during the war, even ones that are not part of the uh, of the military. Uh, an estimated six million women took jobs outside the home during World War II. Um, and to facilitate that, the government actually opened daycare centers in large cities so that women would have child care um, because it was, you know, at the time, very uncommon for women to work outside the home. And so, um, you know, that was to help women who, who needed that uh, assistance to do that. And so you have a lot of women working in shipyards and, uh, and factories and all of that. Um, now, that has been a little bit over romanticized by history. And I don't say that to downplay the important role that women played during the war, um, but it has been blown up a little bit in hindsight. Um, the reason I say that is, is twofold. One, as a percentage of the population, a lot more women in the Soviet Union and England uh, worked outside the home than they did in the United States. And also it didn't have a long-term impact uh, women do not work 
outside the home in large numbers after World War II until like the 1970s. So it didn't have this big, you know, cultural uh, impact uh, on, on women for a long time. Um, and just to throw in uh, another example of women serving in the uh, uh, during the war, this was not a military organization, although they sort of were loosely affiliated with the... Uh, with the army in some way, there was an organization called the American Voluntary um, American Women's Voluntary Services, um, and they would do things like drive trucks and deliver goods and supplies and stuff like that uh, domestically within the United States. Uh, and that lower left picture, you might recognize the uh, recently uh, deceased Betty White, uh, who worked as a truck driver delivering supplies to military bases in California during World War II. So. Good for her. Last slide for this video, uh, the effect on the population within the United States and where they lived. Um, the U.S. government gave a lot of defense contracts to the South um, to try to stimulate economic growth there because even, because even after the New Deal, um, the Great Depression had taken a great toll uh, on the South, which at that time was still largely agrarian, right? So the, they opened shipyards in Alabama and South Carolina and all, all the Gulf Coast states. Um, military bases are built throughout the South. Um, some examples locally, Camp Lejeune was uh, the, the Marine Corps base out on the coast of North Carolina was opened in 1941. Uh, Seymour Johnson Air Force Base was built in 1942. Um, a lot of uh, oh, and uh, that does lead to people moving to the south, um, either to serve in the military or to work in those factories and stuff, right? Um, and that's going to continue after World War II, uh, as we call it. It's called the Sun Belt Movement. People moving into like the southern third of the country uh, in the later half of the 20th century. A lot of cities become what we call wartime boom towns um, because of uh, wartime production happening there and people moving there to work uh, in various factories. Los Angeles, um, the docks there. Uh, Seattle was a large area where planes are made. That's where Boeing is, right? Detroit with the auto factories that were converted to wartime production. Lots of people trying to work there too. Um, and we see a continuation of the Great Migration that starts during World War I where African Americans uh, in the South were moving north to find work. That happens again during World War II. Um, and even on a larger scale uh, during this time. And by 1970, the 1970s U.S. Census was the first one in which there were more African Americans living outside the South than in the South. So, you know, up until that point, uh, really up until World War II, the vast majority of the black population in America was in the South, and that changes, uh, and World War II facilitates that change. All right, that's going to be it for part one. We will look in more detail at uh, how World War II uh, impacted various groups in the United States, um, so stay tuned for part two of this video. Cheers!